Hello, Bloodstream listeners, Patrick here, and welcome to your Wednesday dose of Bleeding Disorders Awareness Month. I hope your week and your month is off to a strong start, and I hope you enjoyed our previous two episodes on Bleeding Disorders Awareness Month and hemophilia, and thanks for coming back today to learn a little bit more about the most common inherited blood disorder, von Willebrand disease. Thanks as well to Bloodstream's presenting sponsor, Takeda. Visit bleedingdisorders.com to learn more. And it's true, von Willebrand disease is the most common inherited blood disorder, affecting up to 1% of the U.S. population, or approximately 1 in every 100 people, or approximately 3.2 million American human people. That said, according to the CDC, between 2012 and 2016, only around 14,600 people with von Willebrand disease were seen at a hemophilia treatment center. That's only 0.5% of the estimated VWD population. So while von Willebrand disease might be the most common bleeding disorder, it's certainly not the best understood or most widely diagnosed. VWD occurs equally across all races and ethnicities, and while it also occurs equally in men and women, women may be more symptomatic due to heavy menstrual bleeding. All right, so I've already thrown a bunch of numbers out at you, but I should probably actually define what von Willebrand disease is before we go much further. So, many different proteins are needed to make a person's blood clot successfully. We've spoken already about factor 8, factor 9, and factor 11 proteins on yesterday's episode about hemophilia. Well, people with von Willebrand disease are either missing or low in the clotting protein known as von Willebrand factor, or, and this is a distinct difference from people with hemophilia, the von Willebrand factor is present but doesn't work or behave as it's supposed to. For a person to make a successful clot, von Willebrand factor binds to factor VIII and platelets in the blood vessel walls. This process will help form a platelet plug during the clotting process, which is the end result of what we call primary hemostasis. People with von Willebrand disease are not able to form this platelet plug, or it will take longer for it to form. The condition is named after Finnish physician Eric von Willebrand, who first described it in the 1920s, a hundred years ago. So let's talk about the symptoms of von Willebrand disease. What are they? Well, here's some of the main ones. Frequent nosebleeds that last longer than five minutes, and frequent is defined as more than five in a year. Bleeding from cuts or injuries that lasts longer than 10 minutes. Bruising easily with bruises that are raised and larger than a quarter. Being told that you are low in iron or have been treated for anemia. Having bleeding after any surgery, including dental surgery. Having someone in your family who has one or more of these symptoms. Have someone in your family who has been diagnosed with a bleeding disorder, such as von Willebrand disease or hemophilia. For women and girls and those who menstruate, heavy periods, also called heavy menstrual bleeding, which is defined as having to change one pad or tampon every hour, or periods that last longer than seven days, heavy bleeding after childbirth or miscarriage. These are the main symptoms of von Willebrand disease. Von Willebrand disease is also interesting in that it is subcategorized into types. There is a few different ones. There's three main types and then a fourth, which is acquired von Willebrand disease, which is not hereditary. But let's talk about type 1 von Willebrand disease, which is found in 60 to 80% of patients. People with type 1 VWD have low levels of von Willebrand factor in their blood. It ranges from 20 to 50% of normal. The symptoms are usually mild. There is one subtype called type 1C, where the von Willebrand factor has increased clearance, leading to prolonged bleeding. Type 2 von Willebrand disease is found in 15 to 30% of patients, and people with type 2 VWD have normal levels of von Willebrand factor, but the factor doesn't function as it should. I pointed that out earlier as a distinct difference from people with hemophilia. And now type 2 is further broken down into four subtypes. Can you see why von Willebrand disease can be challenging to diagnose and manage? Type 2A, type 2B, type 2M, and type 2N, depending on the specific way the von Willebrand factor is defective. And the symptoms in type 2 can range from mild to moderate. 
Type 3 von Willebrand disease is found in 5 to 10% of patients, and these patients have very low levels or no von Willebrand factor in their blood. Some people with this type of VWD may also be low in factor 8. Symptoms are typically severe and include spontaneous bleeding episodes, often into their joints and muscles, and often that bleeding can look similar to bleeding as a result of hemophilia. Acquired von Willebrand disease, this type of von Willebrand disease in adults results after a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease such as lupus or from heart disease or some types of cancer. It can also occur after taking certain medications. That's a little frightening. So let's talk now quickly about how VWD is diagnosed because this is one of the challenges with getting more people diagnosed. There's a combination of blood tests that are needed, including a von Willebrand factor antigen test, which measures the amount of von Willebrand factor in the blood. There's tests that measure clotting time and the ability to form a clot, and tests that measure platelet function. Now, some of these tests may have to be repeated because the levels of von Willebrand factor can change due to stress, exercise, the use of birth control pills, pregnancy, and hyperthyroidism. People with von Willebrand disease usually have less than 50% of normal von Willebrand factor in their blood. After a diagnosis of von Willebrand disease is discovered, an additional test is given to determine the type. Now, the best place for patients with bleeding disorders to be diagnosed and treated is at one of the federally funded hemophilia treatment centers that are spread throughout the country. HTCs provide comprehensive care from skilled hematologists and other professional staff, including nurses, physical therapists, social workers, and sometimes dentists, dietitians, and other health care providers. In addition, HTCs often have the specialized labs that can run more accurate VWD testing. Lastly, how is von Willebrand disease treated? Well, that depends on the diagnosis and the severity. Some bleeds are mild enough not to require treatment at all. The most common treatment for von Willebrand disease is desmopressin acetate, more commonly referred to as DDAVP, which stimulates the release of von Willebrand factor from cells. This also increases the level of factor eight. DDAVP comes in two forms injectable, where it is injected into a vein or just under the skin and is used to treat milder forms of VWD, usually type 1, and nasal spray. This high-dose nasal spray is used to treat milder forms of VWD, usually type 1, as well. One important note, Stymate, the DDAVP nasal spray, was subject to a recall in September of 2020. Faring Pharmaceuticals, the company that makes Stymate, does not anticipate resupplying Stymate until 2022. There's more information about that in the program notes. More severe forms of von Willebrand disease are treated with factor replacement therapy, which are either plasma-derived, made from human blood products, or recombinant, synthetic, as we talked about yesterday, with hemophilia. These clotting factor products are rich in von Willebrand factor and factor VIII. Clotting factor products are injected into a vein in the arm to replace the missing factor in the blood. They may also be used to treat mild von Willebrand disease in people who do not respond to DDVAP. Hormone therapy such as birth control pills or oral contraceptives can be taken to reduce heavy menstrual bleeding. The hormones in birth control pills can increase the levels of von Willebrand factor and factor VIII in the blood. So as you can see, von Willebrand disease has a number of complexities to it, which again is why it has been traditionally challenging to diagnose and manage effectively, and which is why the recently published clinical guidelines on diagnosis and management from the American Society of Hematology, the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, the National Hemophilia Foundation, and the World Federation of Hemophilia is such a big deal. To learn more about von Willebrand disease, please check out either Hemophilia Federation of America or National Hemophilia Foundation's websites. You can also follow links in the program notes to those sites, as well as to thesciencefair.org, Believe Limited's virtual science fair for the bleeding disorders community. And that will do it for today's episode. I hope you learned a little bit about von Willebrand disease, the most common but certainly not best known bleeding disorder. And we'll be back tomorrow with another special mini episode to celebrate Bleeding Disorders Awareness Month all across the month of March. Thanks again for listening. Thanks again to CadaBleedingDisorders.com to learn more. I will talk to you tomorrow. And until then, take self-care of yourself. 